Okay, so uh, we're talking about the New Republic. Uh, what we're going to focus on is the Articles Confederation that are in place in the government of the United States uh, post-American Revolution and how that progresses into the United States Constitution. All right. A republic is essentially a government in which citizens rule through elected representatives. Uh, and we still do this today. Um, the people, we vote for someone. We vote for our senator, we vote for our, our representative of the area, and they move into the government. Uh, and it's all behind this idea that government should be based on the consent of the government. All right, the consent of the government. Keep in mind those John Locke ideas from the Declaration that we have to establish a government to protect our individual rights. This is what's going on here. Now at this time, uh, at this time during the revolution, each state uh, or each colony became a state, uh, and each state had their own constitution limiting power to the government. Most of them had three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial, like our government will once it turns to the constitution. Uh, but there is this concept of, you know, what are people, um, who can vote, essentially, and at this time it's very limited. Uh, you had to own property. You had to be a male. Uh, sorry, women, but you also had to be a white male in most cases, uh, if not all. Uh, slaves obviously couldn't vote, uh, and then certain laws would prohibit other races from uh, partaking in government as well. Now, at the time, America is operating under the Articles Confederation. This is passed in November of 1777 and then ratified in 1781. So it's passed during the war, right as we start the war, and it's ratified just before the war ends, about two years. And what this Articles is, is a loose confederation of United States. Uh, and confederation is, you know, essentially a unification or a put together union of, of loose states that have their own separate political entities. Um, and what the Articles operates under is this concept of being a loose confederation of the United States. All right, each state, Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, so on and so forth, they banded together. They created a confederation, which is this loose union, which would be known as the United States. Um, it has very limited central power. The federal government under this, under this, uh, under the Articles, is uh, it's limited in what it can do. The states have way more power in this system. However, the federal government can declare war and sign treaties. This is how it signs the Treaty of Paris. It can also print and borrow money and settle disputes if any of the states are, dis are in disagreement with one another. Now, as we saw in class, the Articles have several problems. Uh, important laws needed 9 out of 13 votes. And with our uh, group activity, you saw how 9 out of 13 was near impossible. So you can see how to change the Articles, needing 13 out of 13 votes would be just... Uh, almost unheard of. How would you do it? 13 out of 13. We couldn't come in to come to a consensus in class about the extra credit project. All right. So just imagine that and apply that here. Uh, 13 out of 13 and 9 out of 13. You know, very difficult to get anything done. There's no executive branch. There's no judicial branch. So there's no president, and there's no Supreme Court. They cannot regulate any commerce or trade, which is some of the problems they're going to have. They can't tax. And remember, America is left with debt after the war. It has to pay off those debts. And then on top of that, the states had more power. If a state disagreed with something, they could block it out. Now, there's also land issues going on. Many states were fearful of others, of, uh, many states were fearful of others taking western lands and gaining more power. You can see some expansion going on here, some of the stuff that they took after the war. Um, but keep in mind, this is like that thing we discussed in class, uh, another aspect of individualism, each state acting in its own self-interest. Certain states want more land, they want more power, other states are trying to hinder that. Uh, so before the articles are going to be ratified, uh, there's going to be certain rules that are going to be put in place. The first of these is the land ordinance of 1785. Um, Congress essentially just split off split up lots of land, newly acquired land, and sold it. This was a great way to settle the land they had won in the war and to pay off a debt. Um, 640 acres were uh, given to the family in the town. Uh, the cost was about a dollar an acre. Uh, so keep in mind, the land ordinance is just a very simple surveying of land that allows, uh, allows new lands acquired to be settled. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 is uh, a little bit more complicated. Now, it set up essentially how to govern new Northwest Territory, uh, such in the map down here. Uh, land between the Ohio, the Mississippi, and the Great Lakes is what we're looking at right here. So we've got the Great Lakes, this tier up here, and we've got the lands in this area here, the Mississippi R River running up the coast, the Ohio River running down here. 
and then the Mississippi up the coast, like I said. So we've got these, uh, essentially these lands right here that are highlighted in green. It set rules on how to become a state. So each territory had to acquire 5,000 people. And once they did, they could set up a temporary constitution, but they weren't done. Once they got 60,000 people living in the state, they could create a permanent constitution. That permanent constitution could be sent to Congress, and if Congress approved, then the territory becomes a state. All right. So essentially, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 sets up a precedent for other states to follow on how to become, or other territories to follow, on how to become a state. Uh, and another important aspect of the Northwest Ordinance is that slavery was prohibited north and west of the Ohio River. So this is one of the first uh, laws passed in the country to actually prohibit uh, the institution of slavery in a given area. Now there's also political and economic problems going on in the U.S. at the time. Uh, there's no national unity. Keep in mind, individualism is rampant. Uh, states would only pay for things that affected them directly. Okay, Virginia will not pay for the debt of Rhode Island. Keep that in mind. This is another aspect of individualism, but here you got more of a statism. One state, one vote, that's a problem, okay? Uh, look at it this way. You have Georgia, it's got 23,000 people. We have Massachusetts, that has 230,000 people, and they each get one vote. Now you say, ah, that's equality, but is it really? All right, we have to think about these things. There's also no taxes under the federal government, and we have a huge debt from the revolution. And then Shays' Rebellion happens, and it really just solidifies Americans' most, all of America's fears about this shaky government that they're experiencing. Daniel Shays is the guy that leads the uh, revolt. He's a farmer. He's a former soldier. Uh, at the time, Massachusetts is taxing him and other farmers way, way too much. And at the same, they're already in debt because of taxes. They're trying to get some tax relief, but the government won't give it to them. The Massachusetts government won't give it to them. So what do they do? Well, eventually they revolt. Armies of farmers joined Shays in 1786. They closed the courts in Massachusetts, like in the documents they, you read. And then they marched to get more weapons to go to uh, those supply depots, like the British were attacking at Lexington and Concord. They go to get more weapons, and this is where they're finally put down. The army has to put the rebellion down. Um, Washington's going to say that uh, what a triumph for our enemies to find that we are incapable of governing ourselves. And he's talking about how this Articles Confederation, it's not working. America is an experiment at this time. All the nations of the world are looking in on us, and we're failing. We're not able to govern ourselves. All right, so obviously some things need to be changed. All of the states but Rhode Island are going to meet in Philadelphia to revise the Articles. Washington is going to preside over the talks. He comes down off of Mount, uh, Mount Vernon and sits, uh, sits ahead over the talks. Keep in mind, Washington's very tall. He's a big, imposing figure for the time. He's the kind of guy you'd want in a room. Uh, when he says, be quiet, people listen. All right. Everyone there agreed to strengthen the central government for the most part. There were some dissenters. Uh, most of the disagreement is going to revolve around how to strengthen the government. All right. Leaders begin to propose their own plans on how to change the government. One plan we looked at uh, intensely was the Virginia plan, proposed by James Madison. Uh, it set up a bicameral or two-house legislature. And like I said, if you look at the modern equivalent like that, today in Congress, we have the House of Representatives. So we have the House of Rep. And we also have the Senate. So you can see some things that have held over from that area. Uh, but his plan was based on each state's population. So you have Virginia who is a state with a huge population, we'll just say, you know, theoretically, they have 500,000 people. They're going to have way more representatives in Congress than, say, uh, you know, Georgia, who might only have 250. Now, another plan that was proposed by William Patterson uh, was the New Jersey plan, and it called for a single house legislature where each state had a single vote. So you have one house, each state has one vote. Um, do you see any problems with this? I mean, it's very much like the Articles of Confederation activity we did. Very hard to pass anything given the rules. And then you've got states with maybe uh, a few thousand people are just as equal as a state with 500,000 people. So it's kind of a complicated situation. But obviously, um, you know, something has to happen. They can't stick with the status quo or the articles. They've got to change things. So they're going to create a compromise, not just a compromise, but the great compromise. Excuse me. It's going to be established by Roger Sherman. He's going to present it, and people are going to fall in suit. Each state's going to have equal representation in the upper house, the Senate. This is why today we send two senators from each state. All right. 
Population size would determine the representation in the lower house, which is the House of Representatives. And today, our representatives are based on our state population. All right, so we have state pop. So here you can see elements of their New Jersey plan in the Senate and the Virginia plan in the House. And you can also see a element of the Virginia plan because there are two houses, two uh, bodies. So it is a bicameral legislature. So these ideas did carry through. Uh, at the time, people are going to elect the members of the House, so the popular vote would matter. But as far as the Senate goes, your state government would pick the members of the Senate. And this lasts all the way up until the uh, uh, right around the 1900, the turn of the century. Um, you would elect the state government, yes, but then the state government would choose the senators. Another issue that's on the table is the issue of slavery. It's a hot topic. Not many people know what to do with it or whether or not it should even exist. But they're there nonetheless, and they have to be counted. Now you can imagine southern uh, southern states with a lot of slaves want slaves to be counted as population because that's going to increase their representation. You can imagine northern states are probably not so uh, inclined to do that because they don't want to be swamped by a slave population and have the south dictate everything. So what do they do? They meet. They come to another compromise. This one's known as the three-fifths compromise where you take five slaves and for every five slaves you count three of them. So three-fifths three of the slaves would be counted as population. So you have three out of five, or let's say you have 300 out of 500, or 3,000 out of 5,000. And that's just how the counting would go. It would keep all slaves from being counted, but at the same time, it would allow some slaves to be counted towards population. Um, this is going to settle the political issue as far as the Constitution, but the economic issue, all right, this agrarian South, or even the moral issue, should slavery exist, is not going to be settled. Um, Congress is basically going to look at this situation and say, what do we do about slavery? Well, here's an idea. Let's just throw it off for a few years. So they basically just come out and say, let's wait 20 years, and then we can talk about slave trade. Now, when the government is created, when it's designed, uh, America jumps on board with the Enlightenment thinking of Montesquieu, where you have the separation of powers. All right, three branches of government, what are they? We have the executive branch right here, we have the legislative branch right here, and we have the judicial branch right here. Remember, the legislative branch is where you have Congress. We talked about this in class. Executive is president, and the judicial branch is the Supreme Court. Each one of them has their own powers. That's why you have this separation of powers splitting off into three different directions. All right, the executive branch makes laws. The House and the Senate agree on a law, and they send it to the president. Okay. Now, the president will either sign off of the law or veto the law. He has that right to do so. He can say, yes, make it a law. No, don't make it a law. And it will go back to Congress, and Congress has to decide, excuse me, if he vetoes the law, then it will go back to Congress, and Congress can either try to recreate the law or they can over outvote his veto, which is the checks and balances system at work, the separation of powers. All right, But let's suppose that the president does say, yes, let's make it a law. Well, then it goes out in the world, and he enforces it, which is what the president is supposed to do, make sure the laws are being enforced. But somehow, let's say through judicial review or because of a lawsuit, it works its way back to the judicial branch, and this is where they come into, uh, into play. The judicial branch interprets the laws, which means that they will come up and decide whether or not the law is constitutional. If they say it's unconstitutional, then the law is out, and it's no longer applied. If they say it is constitutional, then it has to be applied and it's a done deal. Now, if the judicial branch were to say it's not constitutional, the legislative branch, the people that amend the Constitution, can always amend the Constitution and say that, yes, we are now making this law applicable. All right? But this is that separation of powers, and this is how they all isolate themselves from each other or differentiate from one another. Now, America is also going to operate under a system of federalism. Uh, Federalism is this balance of power between the state and the national governments and how they share powers. We have state governments, we have national governments, we have them today. Um, and they're split between what is known as delegated and enumerated powers. Delegated and enumerated. Powers granted to the national government by the Constitution, uh, foreign affairs, national defense, coin money, uh, things such as that. This is what is known as delegated and enumerated powers. All right. These two concepts, delegated and enumerated, Fancy words, big words, is what you would call like a 50-cent word, um, are 
given to the national government. It's things that the national government can do. On the other end of that spectrum is the reserved powers. Uh, these are powers that are granted to the states by the Constitution, which is education, marriage laws, trade regulation within the state, not outside of the state. Um, these are powers that are, again, reserved for the states. So these delegated or enumerated powers are given to the national government. Reserved powers are reserved for the state. However, both the state and the national government can create courts and they can tax you, which is why in Georgia today we have an income tax and we also have a federal tax. All right. Um, back to these enlightenment ideas. Uh, as far as checks and balances goes, this pays. This plays back in our separation of powers. Uh, this is an enlightenment idea. It goes back to the concept of Montesquieu and whatnot. But basically, checks and balances is created to prevent one branch from getting too powerful, such as the president overwhelming the other two. In which case, you would have some kind of form of tyranny. Um, so it is a prevention measure. Um, and the example down here is great. The president's actions have to be approved by the Senate. The president can veto laws, okay? So if the Senate or the uh, Congress makes a law, they send it to the president, he can veto it, all right? He could say, no thanks, don't want it, slash it out. But then Congress can come back and they can override a presidential veto with two-thirds of the vote, all right? And then the Supreme Court could come back and they can interpret those laws as it is passed. So you see it just kind of goes back and forth and back and forth so that when you got something out, it's something that's all agreed on and it's not forced down the uh, people's throat or any other branch of government's throat, all right? If allowed unchecked, one branch could become too powerful, all right? If the president is not checked, he can become too powerful. If Congress is not checked, he can become too powerful. And if the judicial branch is unchecked, they can become too powerful. So you see checks and balances has a huge impact on the American government as far as stopping a tyranny. Another thing that's set up for our uh, new government is the way that our electors are sent off and how we elect a president. Uh, this is by the Electoral College. You vote for electors. Each state has an elector uh, per senator. All right, So each state has two right off the bat plus the number of U.S. reps. So you have two electors already plus however many representatives you have. So let's say Georgia, we got 13 representatives. And what I mean by representatives, that is the House of Representatives, okay? So we have the House, and we got two for the Senate. That gives us a total of 15 electoral votes. All right, not overly complicated. Just keep in mind, our number of senators plus our number of House of Representatives peoples equals our number of electoral votes. All right, so we vote for these people. We put these people into office. The electors then vote for the president. All right, so this makes every vote count from the people up without us doing a mass popular vote. All right, keep in mind this is how we elect a president. We don't do a popular vote. Each state does a popular vote. Each state votes for their senators and their House of Representatives. But what comes down to it, it's really a mathematical game. 15 plus 9. All right. 15 plus 9, like I said, uh, plus 8, uh, equals an, a certain number of electoral votes. And what you have to have here is you have to have so many electoral votes to win. So we'll say, uh, you know, in the last race that Obama's getting 275, and we'll say that McCain's getting 175, and we've got to have a majority or over 50% to win this thing, uh, which Obama in these numbers, this is the magic number, so to speak. So he would have actually won this, all right? And again, it's an addition game. This plus this plus this plus this plus this, so on and so forth. So these votes up here, keep in mind this electoral system, it matters on how we pull out a president. Now to look at the Constitution just a little bit. Now to look at the Constitution just a little bit. Um, the preamble, uh, very very um, eloquent, uh, very straightforward, very uh, matter-of-fact way of stating how our government is and what the government is and what the Constitution establishes for the people of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, all right, keep in mind we had a union under the AOC and they saw it as too shaky, so they're making a more perfect union. They want to establish justice, all right, justice, judicial branch, something we did not have before, ensure domestic tranquility, all right, the states get along instead of having all these differentiated taxes. Provide for the common defense. Keep in mind the AOC could not have a military. Promote the general welfare, taxation. Secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. All right, 
which means the government is there to protect our rights. Remember what liberty is, our rights to ourselves, and later on, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America, which means the people that want these aims, all right, these old aims that were not available in the Articles of Confederation, created this document, the Constitution, for the USA. All right, so that's just a brief intro to the Constitution and what its aim is to do. All right, now the Constitution is broken up into uh, different segments. You have seven articles total. One is for the legislative branch. It is the longest. Number two is for the executive branch, which is everything that the president can do. All his powers are listed. Three is the judicial branch. Number four is the states. Number five is how you amend the Constitution. It gives you directions. Six is constitutional law and it tells you how the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And number seven is ratification, all right, how you change or how you apply an amendment. Nine out of 13 states, nine out of 13 states must ratify this. Uh, it's established September 17th, 1787. All right, so in order for these, the Constitution to be in place, in order for it to be the government, nine out of the 13 states have to ratify the Constitution, or we're going to continue to operate under the Articles of Confederation. Now, a lot of people would not sign off on the Constitution unless there was a Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights is the first ten amendments to the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is our basic rights, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, uh, the right to own and bear arms, so on and so forth. These are rights that are given to us by the Constitution, these unalienable rights. They are justified and they are protected under the Bill of Rights. And because of the Bill of Rights, more people are going to be sold on the Constitution and they're going to buy into it and agree to it. Now, um, in creating the Constitution, you're kind of going to have your first political party show up, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Federalists, keep in mind, federal, as in federal government or Fed, uh, a real simple way to remember what they're advocating. They supported the Constitution, and they liked the new balance of power. Uh, these included people like George Washington, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. Madison is kind of an iffy character. Remember, he calls the Constitutional Convention. He gets them together, and he advocates a lot of these ideas. But then at one point, he's going to decide, well, you're wanting, more, you're wanting way too much power, and I don't like this. And he's going to kind of pull out after a while. But for right now, he's definitely a Federalist. On the other side of this, uh, or on the, in the opposition, are the Anti-Federalists. They're opposed to the Constitution. They opposed a strong central government. They wanted limited government because they felt that government overpowered the rights of the people. These include people like Patrick Henry, Sam Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. All right. And then last but, not, uh, but definitely not least is how do you sell this Constitution? Because the Constitution does pass, and how do you get the people behind it? Well, Federalist Papers. It's a series of 85 essays which defend the Constitution, and we are going to look at these in class as well. And it helped the people, people like you and me, it helped them come to terms and help them realize what the Constitution was and what it was going to do for them.